Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to everyone's favorite topic, carbs, right? Carbohydrate. We're going to talk about the carbohydrates, sugars, starches, and fibers. We'll talk about the differences and the similarities, and we'll talk about um, carbohydrates and their role in our health. Okay, let's start with our icebreaker. Your brain needs carbohydrates to power its activities. What are your go-to snacks when studying for exams, going to the gym? Why are some better for you than others? So let's start with that, the beginning premise there, right? That the brain needs carbs. Um, so yeah, par parts of your brain absolutely rely on glucose, but there are other fuels like the astrocytes in your brain. They actually convert glucose into lactate, and then that can be used as a fuel source by other parts of your brain. Uh, your brain can be fueled by ketones, uh, but you know, carbs, uh, glucose is a is a great uh, fuel source for the brain. But when we talk about needing something right there, we, or, or when we talk about glucose being your primary fuel. Um, what I would say is that your brain and your body will preferentially use glucose first, and that's because um, we, it's so tightly regulated, right? So right now you have maybe four grams of glucose in your, in your bloodstream, unless you're a pre-diabetic or a diabetic, meaning you have less than a teaspoon in your bloodstream. So if you're going to eat three or 400 grams of carbohydrates today, and you only have four grams in your bloodstream at any one time, and it's super tightly regulated, then when you consume carbohydrates, your body needs to use them, right? So it will preferentially use them before other fuels like fat and and, uh, and other fuel sources. But uh, let's see. Um, your red blood cells absolutely need glucose for fuel. They don't have mitochondria. They can't burn other uh, energy sources. So your, your red blood cells need them. Your brain, parts of your brain do need to rely on glucose, but parts can rely on other fuel sources. But this preferential thing, just kind of keep that in mind. Like for example, if you drink alcohol, your body will preferentially use alcohol. It will, it will metabolize alcohol to get rid of it. So you could say that alcohol is your primary fuel source in that situation, but it's more that your body is dealing with what it needs to deal with first. So if you have excess uh, glucose in your blood, that can be a serious problem. So your body will use it. It'll store it and these types of things. So carbs are a great fuel source. I just kind of wanted to talk about that. But isn't that amazing that, you know, the, you know, the, the RDA for carbohydrates is 130 grams a day. The average American probably eats, you know, 300 or more grams of carbs a day, but you only have four grams in your bloodstream at any one moment. And it's super, super, super tightly regulated, right? This is, and thankfully there are ways to, to increase the amount of glucose in your blood too, or else every time you exercise, you would drop dead, right? So pretty neat. So your go-to snacks, and we'll talk, we'll talk about foods, but, um, you, that's that's for you to answer, I guess. But um, why are some better for you than others? I mean, think about um, if you have two carbohydrate sources and one has fiber and one doesn't, then I would say the one with fiber is generally going to be better for you. And then just if you're looking, if you're studying or you're working out, you want, uh, let's say you're getting ready to work out. Well, you're going to want carbs that are going to be digested and absorbed quickly so they get in the bloodstream for your workout. But if you're trying to sustain energy for long periods of time, Maybe you want carbohydrates that are a little slow to digest and they and they don't cause a rapid increase in, in blood glucose. And then we'll cover in this chapter that at what goes up must come down. So whatever causes a rapid increase in blood glucose will lead to an insulin response that causes a more rapid decline as well. So we'll talk about things like the glycemic index there. So just a neat, neat way to think about uh, carbohydrates as we start. All right. Um, so what my nose always itches when I'm doing these. So by the end of this chapter, we should be able to identify the, so chemi chemically, the monosaccharides, the disaccharides, and the polysaccharides. So we'll talk about their, their structures and then also where you find them in food. Summarize carbohydrate digestion and absorption. I promised you we would come back and review digestion of each of the macronutrients on their own. And then explain how the body maintains its blood glucose concentrations and what happens when blood glucose rises too high or falls too low. So you're looking at hyperglycemia, which would be things like type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and then hypoglycemia glycemia if your blood sugar is too low. Okay, really, really itchy. All right, it's a lot of pollen right now. Describe how added sugars can contribute to health problems. So we'll look at, you know, carbohydrates need to be talked about separately uh, with sugars and added sugars. And, you know, there's really, um, there are lots of carbohydrates that, that offer lots of value, but added sugar, usually not so much. Identify the health benefits of and recommendations for starches and fibers, so we'll talk about those. And then summarize the key scientific evidence behind some of the current controversies surrounding carbs and their calories, so we'll cover all that. All right, the chemist's view of carbohydrates. So we're gonna be looking at them from a structural stand, uh, standpoint here. So what is a monosaccharide, a disaccharide, or a polysaccharide? So let's start with that, what saccharide means. It basically means sugar. So a, um, a monosaccharide is going to be a single sugar unit. 
A disaccharide, di means two, will be a pair of monosaccharides attached to each other. And then poly means many. So polysaccharides saccharides are going to be long chains of monosaccharides. Uh, another way to look at this, the monosaccharides and disaccharides are generally classified as what are called simple sugars. And the polysaccharides are classified as complex carbohydrates. So you'll see here that um, these carbohydrates are going to be made, or, or there's a there's, uh, the atoms that make up the, the foods that we eat are primarily carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, but you won't, you won't see nitrogen here. Nitrogen is only found in the amino group, so it's found in amino acids. That's the reason that we have to eat protein, but, but your carbohydrates and your fats are made of different combinations of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. I mentioned this in an earlier video, but one of the, one of the main reasons that there's nine calories in a gram of fat and only four calories in a gram of carbs is that fat has less oxygen, so you can cram more carbon and hydrogen in, onto that teaspoon or whatever. Okay, so let's look at monosaccharides, disaccharides, polysaccharides. I just, uh, again, the, the brain uses glucose as its primary energy source. Again, I would, I would say that it, yeah, it, it, it relies on glucose whenever glucose is available to help keep your blood sugar levels stable. It's also true that red blood cells do rely on glucose. Uh, that's its only fuel source. Muscles store simple sugars in the form of glycogen. So we'll look at, um, you know, we, you know, animals like us, we store glucose in the form of glycogen. It can be stored in two places, your, your muscles and your liver. So we'll come back to that. And then excess sugars are stored as fat. Your body can turn any excess food, any excess calories into fat, whether it's fat, obviously, uh, excess calories from protein, excess carbs, excess alcohol, all these things can be turned into fat. So I like this point here though, where carbs are sometimes mistakenly thought of as fattening and may be avoided by dieters. This may be useful if the carbohydrates come from simple sugars like candy and soft drinks, but it's not the case for whole grain carbohydrates. So let's talk about that, right? Like, so um, a lot of people really like lower carbohydrate diets and some people do really well on high carb diets. So that's completely up to you and your genetics and lifestyle. But um, one of the reasons that I think that people do pretty well on lower carb diets isn't just because of the carbs, right? If you're, if you know, diet, a diet, it, you can't lose weight unless your diet le puts you in a caloric deficit. And a low carb diet does so by removing foods that have a lot of carbs. But the most fattening foods on the planet are mixtures of carbs and fat. So that, so if someone goes on a low carb diet and that they're avoiding, they're avoiding pizza and ice cream and these types of things and cookies, then they will be consuming less carbs and less of those fattening fats, I guess, as well. And, um, that's why that what seems to be beneficial. So people don't um, people don't just eat teaspoons of sugar. Most of the time, it is a combination of carbs and fat that are fattening because they're so cal calorically dense. So for me, if I'm designing a diet for someone, once we got their protein needs met and we make sure they're getting all their micronutrients, carbs and fats just kind of fill in the gaps. Like you want to make sure you get enough fat uh, because if you get too little fat, you have problems with absorbing fat soluble vitamins and making hormones, you get enough fat, and then carbs and fats really just how do you want to fuel your activities? And, and one of the big questions there would be what kind of activities, right? So if you're, and we'll, we'll cover that here in this chapter, but if you're an endurance athlete, your diet might look totally different than a power lifter, for example. Okay, so the monosaccharides, you see here are the three monosaccharides. We have glucose, fructose, and galactose. So glucose is the same glucose that's in your blood. We call it blood sugar or blood glucose. Glucose is a primary fuel source of the human body. And it is a part, like it says there, it's a part of every disaccharide. So we'll come back to those. So glucose is the key. Fructose is actually sweeter than glucose, which is why uh, like table sugar is going to be sweet and honey and these types of things. And then galactose is generally just found in foods that have lactose, which is called a milk sugar. But the key with both fructose and galactose is your liver has to turn them into glucose to use them for fuel. That's why you see something like Gatorade, where, why these things got popular. Um, basically, these energy drinks or these sports performance drinks, they're mixtures of glucose and fructose. So when you, when you take these in, the glucose is ready to be absorbed and uses a fuel right now. The fructose is going to need to be converted to glucose by the liver. So it's like you get a whack of energy now, and then 20, 30 minutes later, you start to get this second boost of energy from the fructose. So that could be a good or bad thing, depending on how you look at it. But that's, that's why these sports performance drinks are going to have a combination of both of those usually. So those are your three monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, galactose. We very rarely see any of them on their own. So you're now then the, this you see you see that uh, this is just the chemical structure of glucose which is C6H12O6 um, and then but that's just how you how you would draw its chemical structure there. 
But now look at these. So you see fructose, glucose, fructose, and galactose, they're quite similar, right? They have the, they all have that same C6H1206, just different arrangements, but these arrangements do impact their sweetness. So like I mentioned earlier, fructose is sweeter than glucose, even though it's made, made of the same things. Just like you take the same Lego blocks and you put them in the different formulations and that's your monosaccharides. So glucose is the key, key energy source, fructose, you'll see that that's found in, in fruit sugar, and then galactose, which is found in lactose. All right, let's do this little matching thing here together. So complex carbohydrates are the polysaccharides. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, sucrose is a disaccharide, which we haven't we haven't gone over the disaccharides yet, but sucrose is a disaccharide. Galactose is a monosaccharide, one of those three. Lactose or milk sugar is a disaccharide. Well, let's, let's just real quick because we're talking about it. Sucrose is going to be a disaccharide, a glucose plus a fructose. Lactose is a disaccharide, a glucose plus a galactose, fructose being our monosaccharide. And then a maltose is a glucose plus another glucose. All right. So I, I don't know why they put that before they actually showed you the disaccharides. So let's look at them. So we have the, the monosaccharides are a single sugar unit. Your disaccharides are pairs. So we have maltose, which I just said is a glucose bonded to another glucose. Sucrose or table sugar is a glucose plus a fructose. And lactose is a glucose plus a galactose. So you see glucose is in all three of them and lactose is called milk sugar. Uh, the types of reactions, so condensation reactions, you basically remove a water when you link monosaccharides together. So if you're building a monosaccharide, you use condensation reactions. It's called that because you're removing water, just like you know water condensing. Hydrolysis, you're using water to tear something apart. So a hydrolysis reaction uses water to split these. So if you're digesting sucrose, for example, you're going to use a hydrolysis reaction to split it into a glucose and a fructose. That glucose, already ready to be used as a fuel source, fructose, the liver will have to convert it to glucose before you can use it. All right, so here we see just that's a hydrolysis reaction like I just explained. So the... Um, Let's, I want to talk a little bit more about the disaccharides. There's not a lot of information here. So where do we see sucrose? Well, sucrose is table sugar, right? Generally comes from things like um, uh, sugar beets and sugar cane, these types of things. So, so the typical table sugar you see on your kitchen counter, that would be sucrose. Now you've probably heard of high fructose corn syrup, uh, very similar, right? Gluc sucrose is 50% glucose, 50% fructose. High fructose corn syrup, let's say it's 55% fructose, 45% glucose. It's not. I don't think high fructose corn syrup is inherently any worse for than sugar it's just that it's so cheap right because corn is a subsidized crop you can you can take this cheap uh, subsidized corn and turn it into sugar so it since it's cheap and it's sweet it can be used you know that's why sugar is in everything right it's in it's in your bread it's just all over the place and part of the reason is because of the cost so but that's a whole separate discussion all right uh so maltose you're not you, you know, malt liquor malted milk balls there are a few things that have quite a bit of maltose in them but you generally don't eat a whole lot of maltose Maltose is going to come from your polysaccharides, which we're going to cover next. These big, long chains of carbohydrates, as you break them apart and digest them, at some point they will be digested into these two glucose units of maltose. So usually most of the maltose in your body right now is from the breakdown of the polysaccharides, like starch and, and glycogen. Uh, so that's maltose. Sucrose we call table sugar, and then lactose is milk sugar. Uh, it's, a glu it's a glucose and a galactose. The bond holding those two together is, is harder for your body to break than the other ones. And then also, uh, a lot of humans don't have the, uh, the enzyme lactase as an adult. As a child, we all have lacto la the enzyme lactase to break down milk sugar from mother's milk. But then, or breast milk. But then, um, as we get older, some of us, some of us stop producing the enzyme lactase, and we become lactose intolerant. Now, that's still for most of human history. That would have been the case all the time, because for most of human history, humans didn't consume milk after they were weaned from their mother's breast. So. Um, there was a mutation that occurred maybe 10, you know, 10,000 years ago in um, Northern Europe, 7,000 years ago in Africa, in different places, these mutations occurred that led to lactase persistence. So some people continued to make the enzyme lactase into adulthood, which meant they could consume dairy products and which obviously would lead to a survival advantage. You have a whole other type of food you can consume. But lactose, and so lactose intolerance would be the, would be the rule, not the exception. For, so most humans, for most of human history, would have been lactose intolerant as adults, but now you're seeing more and more people that can digest lactose as adults. And I would say it varies, right? Like, um, I'm I, like, I can do, I do perfectly fine with, uh, 
We'll talk about lactose intolerance specifically later, but I do perfectly fine with yogurt and cheese and these kind of things, but like a glass of milk just kind of doesn't, I don't feel very good. So I feel like I have a little bit, I have the enzyme lactase, but maybe not as much as some people that enjoy milk and don't have any problems with it. I personally, I've switched to macadamia nut milk and I, and I think it works really well for me. All right, so a little bit more about the disaccharides there. So the polysaccharides, so these are gonna be long chains of glucose. So every one of these little structures you see on the screen here is a glucose. So there, um, we have glycogen, we have starch, you see two different kinds of starch, and then we have your undigestible polysaccharides like cellulose, which is fiber. So fiber would also be on this list. So let's start with starch. Starch is how plants store carbohydrates. So plants have glucose, then they store it as starch. You see, there are two different types of starch, um, amylopectin, which is highly branched, as you can see, and amylose, which is not. So a quick question, which of these do you think your body could digest and release the glucose from faster? Well, it would actually be the amylopectin just because there are so many different branches that it can pull a glucose off of. That amylose on the right, it can only clip a glucose off the two ends. The amylopectin, you got all these different places where you can gra grab a glucose. So if you're consuming, that's why all starches are not the same. If you can consume a starch that has a lot of amylopectin, it'll probably cause your blood sugar to rise faster than if you consume a lot of starch that has amylose in it. So we'll come back to those. So, so starch is how plants store carbs. And then we eat, they don't store them for us, but we take them, right? And then glycogen is going to be how animals store carbohydrates. So these, these, th this is how, or how we store glucose. The key here is that um, there's only two places where glycogen is stored in animals, including humans. That is your muscles and your liver. Key difference though, the glycogen in your muscles is used by the muscles. It can't be given, if you're starving to death and there's glycogen in your muscles, it won't give them up. It won't share it with the rest of your body. So muscle glycogen is just for muscles. That's why if you're an athlete and you're using a bunch of using up a bunch of glycogen by, by running miles and miles and miles or cycling or something, that's why you replenish your glycogen stores after you worked out because your muscles just used a bunch of their glycogen. Liver glycogen is different. Liver glycogen is where we store excess glucose um, after we eat, and then between meals, your body will release liver, liver glycogen to keep your blood sugar stable. Remember earlier I said, you've only got about four grams of glucose in your bloodstream, but why don't you die then in the middle of the night, right? You go to bed, you had supper at six, and you don't eat again until six in the morning. That's a 12 hour window where you're not getting any glucose from food, and you only have less than a teaspoon of it in your bloodstream, so how do you survive? Well, your, your body will release glycogen, and, that, and that's from the liver. So that's the, the, the we'll call, talk about the hormones later, but the hormone glucagon is the one that primarily tells the liver to stop making glycogen and start releasing it. But then your body, this is why carbohydrates are technically not essential. And the term essential means that um, you, you have to eat them because you can't make them or you can't make enough of them. But your body can make carbohydrates. So in the middle of the night, if you haven't eaten, then glucagon, that same hormone, will tell your liver to, to and other, other parts of your body, uh, to increase gluconeogenesis. So genesis means creation, neo means new, glucose. So gluconeogenesis is how your body turns non-carbohydrates, like proteins and like the glycerol backbone of fats, into glucose so your body can actually make it so that's that's why you don't that's why you didn't die last night in your sleep okay so those are those are the two polysaccharides you see there but they're but they're all we also do have fiber right like cellulose would be an example of a fiber uh, and fibers are also polysaccharides the difference is they have bonds in them that we don't have the enzymes to digest which is really a good thing, right? If you had the enzymes to digest um, fiber, then when you ate fiber, it would turn into pure glucose, right? You'd eat a salad and your blood sugar would go through the roof. So because we can't digest fiber, it passes through us and it's you know our roughage and it's good for our gut, but the microbes inside of you can ferment and digest some of that fiber. We'll come back to that. All right, so glycogen and starch are examples of polysaccharides. We've said that. Glycogen is how animals store glucose. Talked about that. Plants store it as starch. Talked about that. And then we talked about how amylopectin is a highly branched starch, which can be turned into glucose much more quickly. And amylose is unbranched. Covered all that. All right, now we have fiber, our last polysaccharide. So whereas starch is how plants store energy, fiber is the structural material of plants. So um, there are two different types, and, you, and two main different types, and you do need to know them. So we have soluble and insoluble fiber. 
So what that means is water soluble or not. So let's start with insoluble fiber. This is what I call roughage. This is the stuff that is undigested really by you and also by your microbes. This is the fiber that just adds bulk to your stool, keeps your stool, keeps your stool moving, um, decreases constipation, cleans out your gut, pulls toxins with it. Lots of health benefits there, but it's not fermented. Soluble fibers are the fermentable fibers. And these are the ones that not only do they add bulk to your stool, but since they draw water in, then they soften your stool, kind of like nature's stool softener, so also decreasing your risk of constipation. But the other benefit of these soluble fibers is that they are fermented by your gut bacteria. So they improve the health of your gut, they, um, they allow these microbes to make fuel for you. They make these short chain fats like butyrate that are used in the colon. So lots and lots of benefits. So both, both are important. And thankfully, when you eat real whole foods, you get both. But I really do try to make sure that people focus on trying to get at least six grams a day of soluble fiber because there are some added health benefits there but they both are really important. Let me give you one example of, and we'll get back to this, but one, one example of why fiber is good for you. Remember from last chapter that your body takes cholesterol and uses it to make bile. So bile is normally squirt into your gut and then reabsorbed. If you eat a high fiber diet, that bile is captured and taken out in your feces, which means that your liver has to then draw on its stores of cholesterol to make new bile. So instead of reusing the same old bile over and over, you're making new bile every day, which means that you're using up cholesterol, which is generally good because most people have cholesterol, well not most, but a lot of people have cholesterol that's too high and using up that extra cholesterol will bring it down. So this is one of the reasons that a high fiber diet decreases your risk of cardiovascular disease and it does so by decreasing your cholesterol levels. All right, um, let's see, resistant starches are really cool. So you, you think starch and you would think, well, starch isn't fiber, but resistant starches are a special kind of starch where um, that, that is resistant to digestion, so it is a type of fiber. Now the trick here is imagine like rice or noodles or things like that. You can increase the resistant starch level in your foods by cooking them and then cooling them. So if you cook a whole bunch of rice on Sunday and then you cool it, and then every day you eat some of it, like for meal, meal prepping, you actually, in my opinion, made it healthier because you increased the amount of resistant starch in it by doing so. Um, and you can reheat it. You don't have to eat it cold, but it has to be heated and then cooled. And during that process, it forms these like cross linkages that become resistant starches. Then when you do, so when you eat leftover carbs, they will have a little more fiber in them. So that's that's kind of a cool thing, resistant starches. Um, phytic acid, this one's brought up quite a bit because it's classified as an anti-nutrient. It can, it can um, bind to some of the minerals and other nutrients that we consume and pull them out of their out of our bodies. Um, that you know, some foods have a lot of phytic acid. There's other ones like oxalates. A good example of that would be spinach. Like spinach has boatloads of calcium in it, but you only absorb maybe 5% of it because of things like phytic acid. So there's so there, so fibers can bind good things too. And I would say that's probably your biggest risk of a high fiber diet. If you eat a diet that's too high in fiber, it will impair absorption of minerals because it's going to trap them the same way that it traps or a bile. But I don't think that's, I mean, that's not a big deal because generally as long as long if you're eating a bunch of high fiber foods, you're also getting more and more minerals, more and more nutrients. So I'm not worried about that. The, the only time I'd really be worried about that is if you eat a really poor diet that's low in minerals and you supplement with fiber or you, or you eat foods that have like a lot of these kind of fake fibers in them but that, don't, that don't come with minerals. All right, digestion and absorption of carbs. So just to review, we'll go through this quickly because we already covered this in detail. But um, let's we'll cover starch and then fiber. So in the mouth, uh, you're mechanically breaking down your food by chewing it and lubricating it and all that. But then there is a, an enzyme called salivary amylase that's in the mouth that does begin the beginning of the digestion of, of polysaccharides. So if you want a cool example of this, um, it doesn't work for every student, but it works for a lot. Take something like a saltine cracker and just chew it and chew it and chew it. It might take a minute, a minute and a half. The longer you chew it, as long as you keep it lubricated, it may be start to become sweet. So if you see it, if you feel, if you sense it tasting a little sweet, that's because these longer polysaccharides are being broken down into smaller, um, shorter carbs uh, in, in your mouth. So it's kind of cool. So carb digestion does begin in the mouth with that enzyme salivary amylase. In the stomach, nothing happens because the the low pH destroys salivary amylase. But then when we get in the gut. In the small intestine, the pancreatic amylases take over. So they take these large carbohydrates and break them down into smaller and smaller chunks. Then you see there right at the end at what's called the brush border, which is the 
the lining of your intestines, the en the enzymes that finish off digestion take place. So that so the long your long starches are turned into little maltoses, and then the enzyme maltase will break them down into two glucoses. If you consume table sugar, the enzyme sucrase will break will break table sugar down into a glucose and a fructose. And if you're consuming milk, for example, the enzyme lactase will break down the lactose into a glucose and a galactose, and then these will be absorbed. And then just remember that the glucose is already is ready to be used. Um, the, the fructose and galactose have to be converted by the liver. Fiber shouldn't see much of anything happening in the beginning because we are not digesting them, right? By definition, they're not digestible by us. But when you get into the large intestine, you'll see that some uh, bacteria, bacteria are able to ferment some of the fibers. And like I've mentioned a few times, they make short chain fatty acids. I haven't mentioned that they also make gas, right? That's what you think about gas. When you fart, you know, not to be crass, but um, you, what you are releasing gases that were a byproduct of fermentation that you didn't do, right? The microbes inside of you generated that gas. You are expelling it. So we talk, so we covered all the health benefits of fiber. I don't need to cover that much anymore. But let me read this point though. Fiber holds onto water, which is what again it softens your stool and increases the bulk of your stool, so you don't get constipated. Regulates bowel activity, keeping you regular. Um, binds substances like bile and cholesterol, which which we said can be good. And then some minerals, which that can be a bad thing unless you, unless you're eating a really healthy diet, it won't matter. And then carrying them out of the body with your feces. And those short chain fats like butyrate, um, they, are the, they are the fuel source that the colonocytes, the cells of your large intestine use for fuel. They take that fuel and they, incre and, and, and they, make, and they, they hold on to other cells better so your gut is less leaky. They make mucus to protect, protect your gut lining from those trillions and trillions of microbes, all good things. All right, that is an overview of carb digestion. Then absorption, it's they're just going to be they're, they're, the monosaccharides are going to be carried into the villi of your intestines and right into your bloodstream. So you'll see that um, glucose and galactose use active transport, which does require some ATP. Uh, fructose uses facilitated diffusion. Not a big deal, but uh, but it's true. And then everything heads to the liver. The glucose can be used for fuel, stored as glycogen, released to the body to be used for fuel, stored as fat. Uh, glu uh, fructose and galactose, they need to be converted to um, glucose in the liver. Now, one thing about that, this is why, you know, some some foods that have a lot of fructose, they actually will be, um, they'll be advertised as being good for your blood sugar. Because when you consume, if you consume a whole lot of fructose, it's not going to cause a rapid climb in your blood glucose. And that's because it's not going to be, it's not glucose yet. It's going to, it has to be converted to glucose in the liver and that's going to take a little bit of time. So you might see some quote unquote health foods that are, that are advertised for their low glycemic index or the fact that they don't cause your blood sugar to spike. It's still all going to be glucose. It's just going to be a little bit slowed down. So I wouldn't actually look at that as a, as a health benefit most of the time. Now, which of the following takes place in the large intestine? So we have fiber attracting water. I don't know what the other options were. Um, so yeah, the majority of digestion doesn't, n n digestion absorption primarily takes place in the small intestines. And then those enzymes, um, they'll be in the small intestine as well. So the only one of these things happening in the large intestine is fiber attracting water. Okay, describe the digestion process for carbs and how it increases one's feeling of fullness and satiety. Well, I mean, we talked about the first part. But how does eating increase feelings of fullness and satiety? Well, um, generally, protein is going to be the most satiating food, lead to the most satiety. And then we kind of see carbs and fat are a little bit lower. But um, fiber is really good. If you, if you want to stay full longer and you want to feel full, then fiber is a great way to stay full. So I would say that um, if you have a lot of protein in your diet, a lot of fiber in your diet, you're drinking a lot of water, those are like the key things that you can do to, to, to feel full. Um, so I, so I would say when it comes to carbs, obviously eating, you know, drinking a soda isn't going to help you feel full at all because, um, um, it's going to be so rapidly digested and absorbed. It's going to cause your blood glucose to climb pretty quickly. Uh, but your body will deal with that pretty quickly and then you'll be ready to eat because there's nothing in your stomach. But, uh, but a salad is going to be a totally different thing. So when you, so not all carbs are created equal when it comes to fullness and satiety. All right, like it says there, if fiber is present in the stomach, it delays gastric emptying. So we talked about all that. All right, I've already covered this, but lactose intolerance. So, you know, for most people at some point in their life are not going to have enough of the enzyme lactase to properly digest milk sugar. 
So, uh, so it's a condition that results from the inability to digest the milk, sugar, lactose. More humans now can do it than ever, but if you don't, so whenever things pass through you and don't get digested, then they get to your, to your large intestine where there's trillions of bacteria that can break things down. So that's why you'll see, if you're seeing intact lactose reach your colon, you're gonna get bloating, gas, abdominal discomfort, and diarrhea. It's going to kind of, it's going to kind of pass through you. Um, it differs from a milk allergy. So, so, so maybe one in a thousand people have an actual milk protein allergy, where if they consume milk, it would be a true allergic reaction. Intolerances cause gut problems. Um, uh, allergies cause immune system issues. Um, so I've already mentioned it's a lactose deficiency. So you don't have, so like, what are some, what are some options? So if someone came to me and thought they were lactose intolerant, I would ask, first of all, unless you're really lactose intolerant, I would ask, okay, you can't drink milk, but what about what about cheese, right? So like a, for example, a, a, a cheddar cheese that's been, you know, aged for a year, year and a half, should have no lactose left in it because the fermenters that turned it into cheese died, broke it down. Same thing with yogurt. Yogurt that's been truly fermented for 24 hours, which most, most store yogurts haven't been, but yogurt that's been truly fermented for 24 hours shouldn't really have any lactose left in it. So if you can't drink milk, but you can eat yogurt, then you are lactose intolerant because they, you let the microbes do the digestion for you there. Um, same thing, maybe if you can't drink regular milk, but you can try like lactate milk, or you can try these milks that have the enzyme lactase added to them. That's something to do. Uh, like what we did, Oliver was lactose intolerant pretty bad when he was younger, but we, when he consumed raw dairy that hadn't been pasteurized, he was fine. And that's because um, the pasteurization process destroys the enzyme lactase, and that's why it's not in normal milk. But you can just, you can go buy what Fairlife milk, I believe has lactase in it. Um, you can buy a lactate brand milk and you can try those things. So those would be some ways if you can't, but if you can't drink milk or eat yogurt, then maybe you have a really severe lactose intolerance, but maybe you have a milk protein allergy and that needs to be looked into. All right, glucose in the body. So we've digested and absorbed our carbs. Now it's time to transport and utilize them. So glucose plays the central role in carbohydrate metabolism, which is true, right? Because if we store glucose as glycogen, we have to turn it back into glucose to use it as fuel. Um, if, we, if we eat fructose or galactose, it has to be turned into glucose to be used for fuel. And then we can, so we can use glucose for energy. It says there we can make glucose from protein. Um, that's gluconeogenesis. And that's true. And then we can also um, we can also make it from glycerol. So about six percent of the energy stored in your body right now is in the glycerol backbone of fat. So fat is obviously mainly fat energy. But when you digest fat, you use the fatty acid tails, which we'll cover in the next chapter. But we have this glycerol backbone that can be turned into glucose as well. It's called glycerol for a reason. So we can we can make glucose from protein and from glycerol. So that's called gluconeogenesis. And then you can also turn fat into ketones. So why does your body do that? Why doesn't your body just burn fat for fuel? Well, if you're on a ketogenic diet or you're in a state of ketosis for fasting or whatever reason, um, the problem is fatty acids can't get to the brain. So your liver makes ketones and then sends them to the brain so the brain can use them as a fuel source. So it's actually a really cool way. I consider ketones the fourth macronutrient. We just don't eat them. You can, you can supplement with them now, but, um, but they are a macronutrient. It's just they're, it's one that your liver makes rather than that you eat. So kind of cool. So we can talk about ketogenic diets and ketosis as we go. Um, provides an alternative fuel source during starvation. So if you're on a ketogenic diet or a really low calorie diet or um, exercise can lead to ketone production, um, fasting, which people do now, can lead to ketone production. Uh, this next point disturbs the body's normal acid-base balance. That's, that's, the, that's not completely true. Uh, that's the difference between ketosis and ketoacidosis. So if you're on a ketogenic diet, then you're in a state of ketosis. Your pH balance hasn't changed at all. Um, ketoacidosis can be a life-threatening condition where you're basically looking at 10 times too many ketones in your bloodstream. Almost always it's called diabetic ketoacidosis because it's almost always called, caused by uncontrolled diabetes. And that causes huge fluid shifts that can lead to dehydration and can cause, cause huge pH problems. So ketosis is a, I mean, something that you did when you were a baby, right? Ketosis is a normal part of our metabolism. Ketoacidosis is a, an extreme example, which certainly can be life-threatening. All right, match the ways the body uses glucose for energy. 
So the reaction for storing glucose is called condensation. We talked about that. When you, when you build um, glucose units, you remove water. Um, the preferred source for the brain and nerve cells is glucose. Again, we've talked about there are alternative fuel sources that can be used, like ketones and, la and lactate, but, uh, but your brain will use glucose as if it's available. And then we talked about how your red blood cells absolutely need glucose. The reaction for breaking down glycogen into glucose is hydrolysis. So if you're if you're if you're breaking a carbohydrate apart or a starch or something down, you use hydrolysis reactions. And then the liver stores one third of the glycogen in your body. The muscles store the other two thirds. But like this says here, there that that glycogen is only going to be used by that muscle. If there's glycogen in your right bicep, your right bicep gets to use it. If there's glycogen in your liver, it's used to keep your blood sugar levels stable, stable between meals. All right, we've hit this pretty good already, but the constancy of blood glucose, that's so true. It's just amazing to think that you can be on a zero carb diet or you can eat 400 or 500 grams of carbs a day and your body keeps your blood sugar stable. O only about four grams in your bloodstream right now. It's less than a teaspoon. If you're a pre-diabetic, you have a teaspoon of, uh, of glucose in your blood right now. If you're a diabetic, you might have one and a quarter teaspoons. So think about that. Like three quarter, the difference between three quarters of a teaspoon in your blood of glucose and one and a quarter teaspoons in your blood is the difference between being perfectly healthy and having diabetes. It's it's amazing how how tight your body regulates this. So how does it do so? Let's start with high blood sugar. So if you have high blood glucose, we'll just read this purple section here, um, that causes the pancreas to release insulin. And insulin, yes, it does lower blood glucose. That's its main job, but it's an anabolic storage hormone. It doesn't just it isn't just used to lower blood glucose by storing it. Let's read all the points here and I'll maybe add a few things. So insulin stimulates the uptake of glucose from the blood into your cells. So it basically tells your cells, hey, hey there's too much glucose. Let's take it into our cells and use it. Um, stimulates the storage of glycogen in the liver and muscles. So again, same thing. Insulin says, hey, we got all this extra glucose. Let's store it up for later. And then lastly, the conversion of excess glucose into fat for storage. So if your glycogen stores are already full, then your glucose is going to have to be turned into fat. And that's where, you know, we'll, we'll talk about dietary intake later, but um, I really think that your activity levels should determine how many carbs you eat, and I'll explain why. But insulin also is needed. This is a separate discussion, but insulin is, it, so it does lead to fat storage. It leads to carb storage, fat storage, and also the absorption and utilization of amino acids. So insulin is needed to, to take up amino acids to build proteins as well. So insulin, very, very important and that's gonna cause your blood glucose to go down. So how do we raise our blood glucose? There's actually tons of different ways your body can do this, which means from an evolutionary standpoint, having low blood sugar was a more common problem than high blood sugar, because insulin does a pretty good job of lowering your blood glucose, but there are multiple mechanisms to raise your blood glucose up. And that's because in the short term, low blood sugar is more dangerous, right? If my blood sugar falls 50 points right now, I could go into a coma and die. If my blood sugar goes up 50 points, nothing's gonna happen. Right, I, I, I will, I'll be fine for 10 or 20 years. So it's much more of an emergency when your blood glucose dips too low than when it climbs too high. Not saying you want high blood glucose at all, but that's why your body has several mechanisms to raise your blood glucose levels. So let's start with glucagon though. It's not the only one. So if, you're, if your blood sugar is going down because you haven't eaten in hours, let's say it's three in the morning and you haven't eaten since six, glucagon is gonna say, it's gonna tell your liver to release that glycogen that it stored up earlier, to keep your blood sugar stable, and then it's gonna it's gonna cause blood glucose to be released in the or glucose to be released in your blood. It's also going to increase gluconeogenesis, so it's you're gonna turn protein and glycerol backbones into glucose. Uh, all those things will happen, and your blood sugar is gonna climb. That's why, if you think about it, it's pretty amazing that when you wake up in the morning you haven't eaten in 12 hours, but your blood sugar is higher usually than you went to bed. And that's because of cortisol. So you see here glucagon and epinephrine, but cortisol, your stress hormone, also raises blood sugar. It does so because if you're in the fight or flight response, you're gonna to wanna to mobilize energy so you can fight or you can flee. Epinephrine, that's adrenaline. Adrenaline will also mobilize energy. So you've got all these other systems that will raise your blood sugar up to, to, to keep it from getting too low. But the reason your blood sugar is generally higher in the morning than when you went to bed is because we're supposed to wake up, you know, basically full of cortisol uh, and, and full of these hormones so we can go and hunt and gather and we're supposed to fire out of bed ready to get to work, right? doesn't always feel that way, but that's, that's why, because of cortisol, we see a, a spike in blood glucose in the morning. All right, but those are, so insulin primarily keeps your blood sugar from going too high. Glucagon primarily keeps your blood sugar from going too low. 
and then a balancing. If you can't balance these things, so if something, if you know, if you if you're having problems, then um, then diabetes is you see type one and type two diabetes. There's also um, obviously you can get you can have temporary diabetes while you're um, pregnant called gestational diabetes. But um, um, if you're if you have hyperglycemia, your blood sugar is too high, then that would usually be type one or type two diabetes. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune condition. It's where the the cells of the pancreas that make insulin are destroyed, so you don't have enough insulin. Type two diabetes is insulin resistance. You actually have too much insulin but it causes your cells to, to, to be less sensitive to it. So a type one diabetic needs to inject insulin. A type two diabetic needs to try to find ways to bring their insulin levels down. All right, so that, and then on the opposite side, you have hypoglycemia. So, you know, this can be very common too. There's two different types. Basically, you can just have hypoglycemia that occurs at any moment, which means you could be perfectly fine and all of a sudden you'd, you'd notice that your blood sugar is starting to tank. Um, and then there's reactive hypoglycemia, which after a meal, if your blood sugar climbs too high, then it kind of tanks. So there are different types of hypoglycemia. But if you do have problems with hypoglycemia, you generally want to keep some sort of glucose or carbohydrate source, you know, a soda, a glucose tablet, something with you so you can bring your blood sugar up um, quickly if it's, if, it's, um, if it's dropping. All right, which food will help improve aspects of health because of their low glycemic response? So we haven't talked about really the glycemic index yet, um, but the uh, glycemic index is every food kind of has a score that says how high it will cause your blood sugar to climb. I don't know how relevant that is. Glycemic load is better because the glycemic load basically takes the glycemic index and then multiplies it by the grams of carbs, right? Because there are some foods that have a high glycemic index, but you don't eat a whole lot of them. And then on the flip side, you see foods that um, have a lower glycemic index, but still they're going to cause your blood sugar to go up for a long period of time. So your glycemic response is going to be how you respond to a food. So um, I don't even know what the options were here, but yeah, so, so white rice is like pure starch. It, it'll cause your blood glucose to go up pretty quickly. Um, watermelon, a little bit, you know, it's fruit. It's going to be a little bit higher, but not going to have a ton of carbohydrates in it. But the, uh, basically, if you're, if you're trying to keep your blood sugar from climbing too high after meals, obviously, you know, determining how many carbs you should be eating would be a big deal, you know, basing that on physical activity and your own personal health goals. But then on top of that, um, eating, if, you, if there's protein and fiber in in the meal that will slow digestion, which will decrease the glycemic response. So I really don't care about these individual numbers, like glycemic index numbers. It's more the meal, right? You want to put together a meal that doesn't cause a huge spike in blood glucose. Like for example, if you're going to have a soda, right? A soda on its own in an empty stomach is going to be absorbed really quickly. If you drank soda while you were having a salad and a meal that has some fat in it and protein in it and these kind of things, the, the blood sugar response would be, would be blunted. I'm not saying that that makes it that much healthier, but still, if it, that's just an example. All right, the health effects and recommendation, recommend intakes of sugars. So we know sugar tastes good, right? But um, but it's very easy to consume uh, a, a too much sugar. And then like we see there, energy with few other nutrients. Sugar is an example of an empty calorie. We talked earlier about how nutrient density is really important, how many nutrients you get per calorie. If you're eating just a teaspoon of sugar, you're getting really no nutrients and just a bunch of calories. So there's nothing wrong with sugar if it fits into your, like it says there, discretionary calories. If it fits into your diet, it's not, it's not crowding out healthier foods, then there's nothing wrong with some sugar, right? So, uh, but just, just depends, depends on the situation, I guess. Um, all right, so one of, the, one of the downsides with consuming sugar is cavities or dental caries. And that's because when you, when you consume sugar, the sugar fermenting bacteria in your mouth will actually, as they ferment the sugar, they will generate acids and acids are going to eat holes in your teeth. Uh, that's why you see here the factors. So bacteria ferment sugars, producing acid, and that's what erodes your enamel and causes cavities. Food factors associated with tooth decay, time of food in the mouth, and sticky food. So how long is it in your mouth? Like, like honestly, if you're going to have a soda, it's better for you to chug it and then, and then rinse your mouth with water than it is to sip on it for three hours. Because if you're sipping on it, you're constantly keeping that glucose in your mouth. So it's basically how, if you're going to consume sugar, how quickly can you get it out of your mouth is, is what it's saying there. How often do you consume sugar? I mean, that's a big deal. Like I, I've had a lot of problems with cavities and things in my in my in my life, and I don't eat sugar anymore, and I haven't had a cavity in in three years. So the longest time in my life that I've ever gone without a cavity, but it's because I don't eat sugar. I mean, next to zero, and um, it's made a huge difference. 
All right. Um, and then there's a lot of things going, you know, genetics certainly play a role. How thick was your enamel to begin with, right? My two, my two stepkids, they both probably eat the same amount of carbs, same amount of sugar. One gets cavities, one doesn't. It's not that one is taking better or worse care of their teeth. There is, there is some sort of a genetic component there as well. All right, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which is what they use to create things like the Choose My Plate and the Food Pyramid, urge consumers to limit intake of added sugars too, and that would be 10% of your calories a day. So if you're eating 2,000 calories a day, that would be 200 calories. And then, uh, of course, there's four calories in a gram. So that would that would be that a typical person should be eating less than 50 grams of added sugar a day. So make sure you're checking your food labels because the amount of sugar in a food and the amount of added sugar are different things. All right. Um, so it says here, people who successfully reduce their intake of added sugar seem to adapt over time, perceiving sugar more intensely and preferring less sugar in their foods and beverages. I agree with that, right? As I am, um, well, I, I really missed some foods as I as I stopped eating sugar, but um, now I don't think it's it's as big of a deal for sure. All right, alternative sweeteners. We have artificial sweeteners, um, which are called non-nutritive sweeteners. These are things like um, NutraSweet and Splenda, sucralose. Um, Overall, like you know, the the at the doses that a typical person is going to consume them, there is no evidence that they cause any adverse problems. But there are studies that show that that switching from regular soda to diet soda helps with weight loss and weight maintenance and these types of things. In some studies, getting someone to drink diet soda, I'm not telling you, I'm not advocating this, and this is not medical advice, but some studies show that getting people to drink diet sodas helps them more than getting to drink water. So. And I think that's because it deal, helps them deal with their sugar cravings. Like I know if I'm craving something sweet, I have a piece of gum. I have a piece of sugar-free gum, which has non nutritive sweeteners in it. I get some cinnamon. I get some watermelon. I get a little bit of that flavor with, with five calories. So um, so artificial sweeteners can definitely be um, play a role in helping people keep their caloric intake down. Uh, so I, I see a lot of value there. Um, if you don't need them, I wouldn't consume them. But I, you know, like I don't let Oliver consume them. You know, I just feel like if there are any negative effects, then on younger developing brains, you might see them. So we just kind of have a policy around the house. But I don't have any problem with it. I actually like I like uh, Mr. Pib Extra Zero is my favorite um, thing with artificial sweeteners in it. So stevia is an artificial sweetener or alternative sweetener, but it is an herbal product. We've actually grown some. We just throw little leaves of it right in tea. It's pretty cool. You can throw it in your sun tea. So it is grass or generally recognized as safe. And then sugar alcohols. This is a little different story. Sugar alcohols do provide calories. So a gram, like erythritol, maltitol, um, a gram of, uh, of sugar alcohol or, or sugar alcohols might be two or three calories per gram, but they're absorbed differently. So they don't cause your blood sugar to climb. That's why like if you're on a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet, people can get away with consuming some of these. But I would say um, totally depends on the person. Like personally, I can't do, I don't do very well with these. I can have a few grams of them occasionally, but if I try to consume these every day, I get a ton of GI problems. Some people don't. Um, the, the sugar alcohol maltitol, which you'll find like in your Atkins bars and Atkins candies and stuff, can't, I can't do that one at all. So if I have, uh, I don't want to give you too much information, but I had a, an Atkins like peanut butter cup thing once years ago, and it was really, really hard on me. Or maybe if you go, if you go online, you can look for the reviews people make about those sugar-free gummy bears. They're, they're not lying. For some people, that's exactly what happens. I have a ton of GI problems if I consume too many of these. Some people can consume them without any problems. So I really think it probably depends on you. Maybe your microbiome matters. So I would just, if you're, if you're consuming sugar alcohols, just kind of test your limits and see what you can tolerate, I guess. So the benefits though, another benefit of sugar alcohols is they're actually biofilm disruptors. So we haven't talked about this in this class. It's more of a microbiology topic, but um, biofilms are um, where microbes can hide. So but the biofilm in your mouth, you've all heard of plaque, right? Plaque is a biofilm formed by the microbes in your mouth so they can hide underneath it. So if you consume sugar-free gum that has sugar alcohol in it, it actually softens the plaque in your teeth. So there are, that's why four out of five dentists or whatever the commercials say, recommend sugar-free gum. But the side effects usually GI and they can be nasty, just, just being honest. Okay, the health effects and recommended intakes of starch and fibers. Health effects of starch and fibers, so decreasing your risk of heart disease, so a diet that's higher in fiber and diets higher in whole grains um, are going to decrease heart disease risk. One of the main reasons is that they capture things like cholesterol, so they help lower your cholesterol. Um, these diets also appear to help um, lower your blood pressure as well, which is great. Soluble fiber, we talked about that. It softens your stool. It, uh, the microbes inside of you ferment it. Lots and lots of benefits. So I think we've talked about this plenty. 
over this lecture, but they do improve heart disease risk factors like cholesterol and blood pressure. And if you want a diet that reduces your heart disease risk, then we'll talk about fasting stuff later, but, but a diet that has fiber in it is definitely a beneficial one. All right, um, so why would diabetes uh, be helped by high fiber foods? So high fiber foods are gonna slow the emptying of food from your stomach, which will, ca will keep your blood sugar from climbing really high. So that's a good benefit there. For GI health, we've already mentioned this, a high fiber foods plus fluid are gonna give you good volume of stool. It's gonna keep you regular. It's gonna keep the health of your intestinal walls intact. So all good things. Um, weight management. So high fiber foods are filling, so they're gonna make you feel full. Uh, and whole grains, same thing. Uh, and so, that, so hopefully you'll eat less and eat less often, which is the goal if you're trying to uh, lose weight or maintain weight loss. All right, lots of, lots of things there. So what could go wrong? Harmful effects of excessive fiber intake. I've mentioned this before. Um, if all you're eating is fiber, then you're not going to get enough calories and other nutrients that, that you need. But you know, I've never seen anybody on a 100% fiber diet, but it can happen. Uh, too much fiber can lead to abdominal pain, gas and diarrhea, bloating, those kind of things. Can lead to GI obstruction, but I mean, you don't see these things, right? There isn't really a recommended tolerable upper intake level, um, but some people can get to the point where they're consuming too much fiber. I, I have mentioned how it decreases nutrient absorption. So a, a poor diet that, that's low in minerals, but really high in fiber, that could be a problem. But usually if you're eating foods that are high in fiber, you're also eating nutrient dense foods. So it shouldn't be an issue. So just like everything else, fiber intake in moderation. You wanna make sure you're getting enough of it, but not more than you need, not too much of it. And then I like this idea of variety as well, different types of fiber. They all offer slight benefits. So if you're eating a bunch of different vegetables, they'll all have fiber, but they'll have different variations of fibers in them, for example. Okay, identify ways in which fiber can help with health issues, including diabetes, colon cancer, heart disease, and gut health. And we just mentioned a lot of these things, but we'll go over them again. Heart disease, by lowering blood pressure, reducing inflammation, improving blood lipids, just by making your gut healthier. If your gut is healthier, then it will be less inflamed. And then, and to me, the number one source of chronic inflammation in the human body is stuff coming in from our gut. So a healthy gut will keep that inflammation at bay, and inflammation is really a, a key trigger of heart disease. Diabetes, we talked about how it slows absorption of glucose. Gut health, more stool, less constipation, all those things covered that. Colon cancer, we didn't, we sort of mentioned. Colon cancer by diluting, binding, and removing harmful agents. So we talked about bile, but it also will trap other, you know, your liver is going to be squirting toxins into your gut, and then fiber is going to grab them and, and pull them out of your body. And then the production of short chain fatty acids just improved the health of your colon altogether. All right, we've talked about soluble versus insoluble fiber. You can read this list and see where you should be getting them from your diet, but a combination of both is always great. So make sure you read this slide. Our uh, recommended intakes of starches and fibers. We covered this a little bit in an earlier chapter, but the DRI or the dietary reference intake for carbs is 45 to 60%. That would be your AMDR actually, the acceptable macronutrient distribution range of carbs is 45 to 65% of your calories. Uh, different for everybody, right? There are people that are on zero, almost zero carb diets and there are people that eat tons. But um, I would say, if you're asking me like how many carbs should I eat, man, this is, I mean, it's tricky, but, and everyone's different. But I always, I, I like to let your physical activity levels determine your carb intake because fat's a phenomenal fuel source at rest. So if you're doing a lot of resting, then you don't need a lot of carbs. If you're really active, you will probably need more carbs. So let's say, let me just give you an example. You're just a typical student and you, um, you have a desk job, you're sitting at school all day. So let's say, uh, so you woke up this morning and you had 100 grams of carbohydrates with your breakfast, which is really easy to do. So those 100 grams of carbs your body would have used to replenish your liver glycogen from last night and, and these types of things, okay? So that was good, good carbs, your body used it. Then you went and sat at school all day and now it's time for lunch. You had another 100 grams of carbs with your lunch. Well, you didn't do anything. So your glycogen stores are already full. So your body will use some of that glucose, but it'll have to store the rest as fat. And then you're gonna go home and kind of sit around and watch Netflix and the same thing's gonna happen with supper. So see, someone that has a very sedentary life, you don't need a ton of carbohydrates. But if you're if you're an endurance athlete and you're training twice a day, you're going to need tons of them, right? I know I know people that eat 500 grams of carbs a day, and it might not be enough. So that's why I always say your activity levels, and every human's different, but your activity levels should determine your carb intake. So I always I always like to say this: if you run marathons, you need to eat a lot of carbohydrates. 
if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, you need to run marathons, right? That, that's the way that I, I generally look at it. So I'm not saying that, that, that everyone needs to be on a low carb diet. No way am I saying that. Um, I think the average American is eating too many carbs and should go on a lower carb diet, but I'm not saying low carb, right? A, a low carb diet is technically any diet that recommends less than 150 grams of carbs a day. So that the last thing I'm saying is everyone should be on the Atkins diet. But if you're eating 400 grams of carbs a day and you don't do much, maybe 300 or 200 would be smarter for you. These, these things, you just play with these things and see how they work for you. What is the RDA for carbs? That's 130 grams a day. That's a, so that's how much your, many carbs your body needs to basically fuel your brain and your red blood cells. But remember, you don't technically need to eat that many carbs because your body can make them. There are people that eat almost zero carbs. Uh, again, not advocating that, just, just explaining that. All right, so um, fiber, how much should we get? So the DRI for fiber is 14 grams per thousand calories. So which, which generally they say, they generally recommend 25 grams of fiber per day for females and, and uh, uh, 38 grams of fiber per day for males, but it really boils down to how many calories you eat. So 14 grams per thousand calories is a good uh, rule of thumb for fiber. All right, from guidelines, we're getting to the end here, from guidelines to groceries. Grains. So we talked about um, earlier, we the government recommends that half the, the, the grains that you eat are whole grains, right? So how do you know if you're finding whole grain products? Uh, a couple things I look for. Go to the ingredient list. The first word should be whole, not enriched or something else. It should, the first word, in because the ingredients are in the order of, that they're in, in, of, by volume. So if the first ingredient, the first word of the first ingredient is whole, then chances are you're getting a really good whole grain product. And then for every... 100 calories, I think you should be getting close to four grams of fiber. So those those are kind of general rules I look at. If like, is a food really good? Because like, yeah, Cinnamon Toast Crunch might have some whole grains in it, but you're not getting that much fiber and, and the word whole is not the first ingredient. So if, you, if you're if you looking for a food, so like it says here, whole grain products provide about one to two grams or more of fiber per serving. I generally feel better if a serving gives you three or four grams of fiber. So a slice of whole wheat bread, an ounce of ready to eat cereal, like a brand cereal. I like the brand buds, like uh, you know, uh, all brand brand buds, all brand high fiber. Those are good good examples. Half a cup of cooked barley, bulgur, grits, and oatmeal. We just had bulgur um, last week. My, my wife made tabbouleh, I think it's called. Um, yeah, so those are those are some general rules. But look, look for that word whole and look for a good amount of fiber per serving. Tips to increase fiber intake, like it says there, eat whole grain breads that have at least three grams of fiber per serving. Three grams of fiber per serving, I feel better with four or five. And then eat whole grain cereals that contain at least five grams of fiber per serving. Those are good ideas. All right, vegetables, really just eat vegetables, right? Vegetables are, uh, most vegetables are gonna have two to three grams of fiber per serving and it's gonna be a combination of soluble and insoluble, so those are all good. Um, eat more vegetables, eat raw vegetables, yeah, eat, eat things with the skin. Those are all great ideas. You can try those. Fruit, kind of the same thing. Rely on fruit instead of fruit juices. Um, if you want fruit that's really high, I would go berries. Berries are the best way to get fiber from food, fruit. And then um, not fruit juice, right? Eat fruit, eat fruit with the skin on, um, avoid fruit juice if you want more fiber. Legumes, which are like peas and beans, uh, six, most, many of them have six to eight grams of fiber. You see some don't have quite as much, like for example, a garbanzo bean, which is also called a chickpea. That's m more known for its protein, so it would have less fiber, but, uh, but even five is great. So you see uh, baked beans, black beans, black-eyed peas, kidney beans, navy beans, and pinto beans have six to eight grams of fiber per serving. Garbanzo beans or, um, oh, I forgot what they're, the other name, no, chickpeas. Um, Great northern beans, lentils, lima beans, and split peas, they have about five grams per serving. So adding legumes to soups and salads and casseroles is a great way to get more fiber too. Okay, covered a lot of ground. Carbs are obviously very important, right? If you're in a nutrition class, to me, if you can master where to get the good carbs, where to get the good fats, and where to get the good proteins, the rest kind of takes care of itself. Okay, we've done all this. You can read through here, but I think we've done a really good job of all these. Yep, covered that ad nauseum. Okay, I hope that this helps. Like I just mentioned, improving the quality of the carbs you eat and, and eating the right amount of carbs based on who you, your genetics, your lifestyle, your activity level, huge determinant in health, especially if you look at the fact that 100 million Americans have diabetes and prediabetes. We are intolerant to the amount of energy that we're consuming, and it's not all carbs. Like I mentioned earlier, foods that have both carbs and fat are the most fattening. But um, we need to do something and improving the quality of your carbs and eating, eating less sugar and more fiber, things like that. Great way to get healthier. Okay.
I hope that this helps. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed.